Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Few things in life are more satisfying than having someone listen to you. In Hebrew, the word Shema means hear, but it's not just hearing what God is calling us to do. It's an active listening at a deeper level than just with our ears. When we devote ourselves to becoming active listeners, you can hear with your heart. When it comes to being a great influencer, many leaders are missing an essential ingredient. Our next guests say you might be an amazing visionary, implementer, and orator, but if you don't listen well, you are leading beneath your potential. Steve Harling is a 35-year veteran of church and nonprofit leadership. As the president of a global ministry, Steve travels around the world mentoring leaders and speaking at mission events, Bible conferences, and leadership retreats. His wife, Becky, is a certified speaker, leadership coach, and trainer with the John Maxwell team. She's the author of several books, including How to Listen So People Will Talk, and she speaks nationally and internationally at conferences, retreats, and training events. You can find out more at BeckyHarling.com. Joining us now to talk about their new book, Listen Well, Lead Better, Becoming the Leader People Want to Follow, are Steve and Becky Harling. Steve and Becky, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Hey, it's great to be great back to be with, with you. you. It's great to meet you, Steve and Becky. Uh, you're a uh, uh, second timer here. We covered the story uh, that you released about um, <clears throat> Listen, how to listen so people will talk, and uh, I think it was incredibly well received because people would rather talk than listen. Their favorite subject is, of course, themselves. But right. when you get them to open up, if you actually listen with your heart and not just with your ears, you find a very deep connection with people when you validate them through hearing. Yes. Uh, Becky, I know that this has been a message that's been resonating with you for many years, and you kind of become the uh, the people whisperer, if you will. Uh, <laughs> Steve, how did uh, you two merge and collaborate on this project? Uh, that's not something oh. that many husband and wives embark on because uh, the number one complaint in marriage counseling is, well, he just doesn't listen to me. Yes, and this has been a learning experience for me. And I have had to learn a lot about listening, not just, just, not just as a corporate executive, but really in the context of marriage and learning how to listen to my wife, to validate her, to recognize that she is something of great value to bring to the table and to support her and bless her in that endeavor. And so for us, I think even as we wrote this book together, this was a tremendous endeavor in learning how to really hear each other well and listen well. And in the process, I think it's actually a great little book. I think it has some tremendously practical tips on how to improve your listening skills. So I'm a learner too, and learned a lot. So part of this is your journey together down the path to listening. Uh, not only your story, but other stories, and of course, uh, strong reference to the biblical foundation of listening. And it's kind of interesting that uh, if we are to be a praying people, we have to believe that God is the best listener of all time. And we don't yes. really think about that. We think about our prayer language, we think about our prayer life, and that's us talking to God. But how much time do we truly devote to listening for the answers? We tend to look that's a different set of senses. That's the eyes. That's the confirmation. That's the signs and the wonders that we seem to look for. But mm -hmm. how often do we truly hear what God is saying? And do we really know how to incline our ear to his voice? Mm. I think you're right. And I, I think that it's an underdeveloped skill for a lot of us that follow Jesus we we do know how to pour out our hearts in prayer and that's probably an underdeveloped skill as well but I but I think even more than that we haven't created the space in our crazy rush rush world to stop and realize hey the Holy Spirit lives in me 
that means he's alive and that means he speaks to me and I need to tune my ear, my ear to listen to his voice. And I, I think that's an important skill for every believer to nurture in their walk and relationship with Christ. If we look at the scriptures, it tells us in Romans, faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. If <clears throat> faith comes by hearing, what else comes by hearing? Well, I think that uh, as the Holy Spirit speaks to us, not only just through his word, but through the still small voice of his spirit living within us. And so faith definitely comes by hearing, but also joy comes by hearing because you realize the Holy Spirit is with me 24 seven. And so I, I think about some of the current crises we are walking through right now, you know, the COVID crisis, the racial tension, all, all of these things. If you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit living in you, and he has wisdom for today as well as tomorrow. And so he brings wisdom and joy through his voice. Steve, as you, uh, you are the CEO of Reach Beyond, which is a global mission agency, uh, when you started down this path, and using you as the model of a proven leader, how did you begin to see the impact that Becky's work in uh, How to Listen So People Will Talk as you begin to apply things that she developed and she found uh, the key to unlock a number of doors, how did you begin to apply that in your work and what was tangible, the tangible result of the application of that concept? Well, you know, I think there's two different elements that I that I really picked up from, from Becky's book, How to Listen So People Will Talk. And the first part was, was really about our relationships with others. But even more importantly than that, there was the part about listening to God and hearing God's voice. And I think I've been on a, on a, on a, a, a journey of learning to listen and discern the voice of God far more than ever before in my life. And I, I think the last few years have been very intensely, uh, you know, it's been something that's been developing within me. And I know that the scripture tells us all the time that God speaks. That is true, he does. Learning to discern his voice and deliberately, intentionally setting aside time to hear his voice has just taken on a whole new level of, of meaning and significance for me. And also, of course, then learning to, uh, to how to lead in a way where I draw out the best of our people. And what I learned early on is, in fact, when Becky and I started off on this journey, and we definitely do stuff together. I mean, it's not just me being the CEO of an agency. We, we do this together. Um, but we decided to spend the first year traveling around the world listening to people and listening to our people all over the planet. And not just our own people, but our partners, indigenous leaders, people from other agencies. We wanted to hear their hearts, their perceptions. What did they think about our organization? Where do they think we needed to grow? How did we need to change? We talked to our donors, our major donors, and we asked them that question. What do you think about us? You know, where do we, where do we need to grow? Where do we need to change? And you know, when people feel like they, when people feel like they actually have a voice, they become much more committed. Um, and there, there's a sense of ownership that develops. If they're just being used to accomplish your end as an organization, they're not going to be motivated. But when they actually feel like they're part of it and have a voice, man, it just unlocks a tremendous amount of doors. You know, there's a television program called Undercover Boss. I love yeah, that Yeah, we like that show. Okay. So, you know, it's a story of, of uh, a CEO of a corporation disguising himself as a laborer, as a worker, and becoming uh, friends and uh, associate with, with people who are his subordinates, but don't know who he is, they don't recognize him, nor I think would any of my field people who had contact with my uh, district managers and my division managers might not even know me uh, if I were to just take a cubicle in the sales pit. Uh, but in all those scenarios, it was the exchange of stories. And they would ask, the, the undercover boss would ask probative questions. What do you do? How do you like what you do? Uh, why is it that you go the extra mile? What is it that people say about you? 
where do you think the company should go? How do you think they should improve? And I began to realize that in this secular program, uh, that there were some very profound biblical truths. And mm -hmm. one of them was, is that it unlocked the key to the spirit of discernment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we don't listen, we cannot be discerners. Absolutely. You know, it, in Proverbs, it Proverbs 2.2, 2, in fact, in the New Living Version, we really like this version, it says to tune your ears to wisdom. So, so it, it's an active um, choice on our part. And when you tune your ears in a conversation with a person, then the Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom and the discernment that you need. I, I think too often uh, in our younger lives, you know, we were anxious to talk. We both communicate for a living, and so it's easy to want to talk, right? But, but learning to tune your ears to wisdom and learning to tune into that other person, then the Holy Spirit gives you the wisdom and the discernment that you're looking for. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because uh, the book of James, of course, he said, if anyone lacks yeah. wisdom, you should ask for it. But actually... Uh, it's uh, an admonition to go back to the beginning. And King Solomon writes that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. So it's actually not this full expectation that I'm going to get this huge download of wisdom. I'm actually going to be sent back to square one That's to right. start the yeah. process to examine do I have a reverent fear of the Lord? Because if I, if I don't, I'm not going to receive wisdom because that's, that's the right. starting point. And mm. in order to have a reverent fear of the Lord means he does the talking, yeah, I do the listening. Right. That's right. That's I love right. that. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I don't have instructions for him. He has instructions for me. And we, right. we see that in Isaiah 6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> here you have Isaiah sitting in the throne room. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the hem of his garment filled the temple, and the angels, the seraphim, sang, encompassing God, holy, holy, holy mm -hmm. is the Lord God mm -hmm. of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And I fell to my knees and said, I'm a, oh, woe, I am a man, I am undone. I'm a man mm. of unclean mm. lips. So the lips are the speaking part. Mm -hmm. right? He hadn't been hearing from the Lord. He was prophesying in his own strength, mm -hmm. doing what he thought was the right things, and certainly it's mm. under the inspiration of God. But now that he had been cleansed, his lips, what he was talking with had been cleansed. His mouth was now shut and his ears were now open where mm. he could hear God ask the question, now, who should I send? Mm -hmm. yeah. And mm. then he could answer with strength to say that now that my ears are inclined to your voice, send mm. me. Yes. That's right. Yes. It's a powerful picture of active listening Mm -hmm. And realizing that we're just not that good at it. Yeah, <laughs> that's not. so true. And and I, I think, yeah, I, I love that passage. That's one of my favorites. You know, I also say, Eric, I, again, this is the, this is the journey of a lot of, a lot of the Old Testament prophets. I mean, I look at Jeremiah, um, an incredible passage where Jeremiah, you know, the Lord speaks very clearly to him and tells him, this is what I'm going to have you do. And Jeremiah comes back with, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not capable. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too that. Mm -hmm. And the Lord's the Lord repeatedly said, "No, I am sending you, and I am with you." And for Jeremiah to have that powerful sense of the Lord is with me, that's the result of of listening to God, hearing Him, being in His presence, allowing Him to speak to you, being receptive to His voice. Um, and I, I, again, this is something those Old Testament <laughs> prophets model for us in a powerful way to, to be able to hear from God and to have that clarity of his message. All throughout Scripture, we have people standing before God saying they're not worthy. 
Oh yeah. my goodness. Yes. Moses. Yeah. Moses, <laughs> Elijah, yeah. you know, every really every one of the prophets <clears throat> were uh, set apart and God could entrust them that if he spoke to them, they would listen. Yeah. So if I'm not an active listener, do I somehow erode your ability to trust me, to have faith and the confidence that you've placed in me if I don't actively listen to you? You know, I think, a, I think a great example of that is Moses. Okay, so in the wilderness, the Lord told, spoke to Moses and said, Moses, strike the rock, or uh, speak to the rock. Mm. Moses, on the other hand, struck the rock. Was he, was he really listening to the Lord or was he reacting out of his own anger, insecurity, whatever was going on inside of him. And there was a consequence for him not listening well to the Lord. And yes, God used him in powerful ways. There's no doubt about that. All those amazing things that Moses did, but there was still a price to be paid. And in the end, he saw the promised land, but he didn't enter it. Mm. And I wonder how many times we, we short circuit the blessing of God because we are not listening well, and we're, we're incorporating a lot of our own emotions, our own thoughts, our own whatever, and, and acting out of that as over against actually hearing God. You and I are uh, close to the same age, so you remember ivory soap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And the tagline was 99 and 44, 100% pure. Yes. Now, if you look that through, through at that through a natural lens, um, that sounds pretty good, right? But right. if you think about the point five six, could be cyanide, it could be <laughs> rat poison, it could be something that was harmful to you. You begin to realize that in God's economy, ninety nine percent obedient <clears throat> is one hundred percent disobedient. That yeah. that it's. Every word, man does not live a, by bread alone, but by every word, word. that That's proceeds right. from the mouth of God. That mm -hmm. means not 99 and 44, 100% of what God has to say, but right. all of what okay. God has to mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we understand that the little bit of leaven spoils the whole batch, that's what distraction and our formulating our own agenda and our own response to what people are imparting to us. They don't want 99 and 44, 100% of our attention. They want 100% of our yeah. attention to feel mm -hmm. fully validated. Yeah. So how do we become self-aware? How do we reframe ourselves into being recipients as opposed to, and I've done this with congregations and with audiences. How many of you say you're a giver? Oh, oh, oh I love to give. Right. And how many of you have a hard time receiving? And oh, both, every, and I say, you know, that's a form of pride. Yeah. Not being able to receive is a form of pride. What did you do to receive your salvation? You did nothing. So you must be a great receiver because you accepted God's gift. So don't tell me you're not good at receiving. Yeah. You've, you've mm -hmm. received right. this incredible gift. Now let's build from there. What other gifts does he have for you that if you'll just pay attention to what he's saying to you and how he's using other people, maybe you'll listen to the wisdom, to mm -hmm. the experience of others. So how do we evaluate ourselves to realize that maybe we're not as good at listening as we ought to be? You no, know, I think it starts with humility, first and foremost. Um, I, I think within all of us is this little part of our humanity that loves to be perceived as being the quote unquote expert. And, and the problem is we need to crucify the expert on the cross with Jesus because 
Jesus calls us to humbly lead others. And that means we need to have the willingness to ask those closest to us, how did I come across in that conversation? How did you experience me in that conversation? Steve and I have both done this with our kids. If you want to start being humble, you really, if you're a parent, should start with your kids because they're usually willing to tell you the truth. And that, but then it branches out to others, you know, close friends or fellow colleagues in a meeting. How did I come across in that meeting? What would you have changed? You know, Steve and I are both public speakers. He was a pastor for years. I, I speak around the country. And so when we are in the audience for each other, the first question we ask each other when we get down from speaking is, what would you have done differently? because we realize that we both need to keep growing in that area and there's always farther than you can go you know when when you're in a meeting with somebody who is monopolizing the conversation 99 percent of the time it, you have to ask yourself okay there's likely that this person really needs to be perceived as the expert there's probably some insecurity there you know but you can learn from that person because you can realize okay I don't want to come across like that. And I think we both have made mistakes in that area. I think we would both say that, you know, that time where you just kind of dump all over another person and you're not asking them about them or, or you're leading a meeting and you have all the answers, you know? And, and so I think it begins with humility. We have to ask the spirit of God to search us. Like David says in Psalm 139, search me, O God, and know my heart. And we have to ask him to uproot that little expert that lives in all of us because that hinders good listening. You know, every time I hear the word expert, I always think that that is <clears throat> somebody who was formerly a spurt. <laughs> <laughs> and I always this wonder, I, I've never really met a spurt. And so yeah. I, there's, there's got to be I, such a thing. <laughs> you know, if they're formally ex, they're an expert, they're formally yeah. a spurt. <clears throat> Uh, I always wondered why that was a credential that, yeah, uh, yeah, that right. people would have. And I'm a word person and a talk show host yeah. and author. And so I, I look at words like that and say, well, what is a spurt? And, and how do you become an expert? Uh, <laughs> yes, and, uh, yes. Is, is, I love that. We might it, use that. You know, it's easy, isn't it, though? It, to me, it is always amazing how many of us that are in senior leadership, whether it's in, in ministry or in the corporate world, have this sense that we're almost afraid to be authentic. And to me, I, you know, with my executive leadership team, I got in the habit of ending every one of our executive team meetings with the question, all right, guys, uh, is there anything that I should have handled differently in this meeting? Um, because I wanted to create a culture where it was okay. It's okay to speak up. It's okay to have a different opinion. It's okay to express a concern but to do it in a way that's honoring and valuing of one another. And that to me is just, I, I see this with a lot of executives, it's like we're afraid to be honest, we're afraid to create a culture where people can speak up. And so they never fully are vested in what we do and in, and, and in our relationships. And so anyway, when I, when I counsel or coach with executives, that's something I really want to uh, continually bring up. How are you creating that culture where people can actually speak back to you? Back in the early 70s, when I started my career in sales, I kept a copy of an article from Reader's Digest in my pocket. Mm. And it was entitled, The Three Least Used Words in the English Language. Oh, great. And those three least used words are, I don't know, or I didn't know. And I would open up conversations with people ask them a question and I would respond with, with either I don't know or I didn't know. Tell me more. Yep. You, mm -hmm. you know, educate me so that I too can know. And we tend to feel that we have to have an answer. Mm -hmm. That if mm -hmm. they ask us a question because we are that expert, uh, that we right. must postulate an answer. But uh, one of the things that, uh, kind of like the Hippocratic Oath of being a rabbi, is mm. that you, in your ordination, when you receive your smicha, your, your credentials, you're, you're kind of taught that the foundational truth is, is that every question must be answered. Mm. 
after a few years of seasoning, you begin to realize that uh, asking a question in response to a question is an answer. That's right. Mm -hmm. And because you become probative, you find out what's behind the question, and that's yes. where we need to get to in order to find out what the root of the question is. And we have to do that becoming probative and by applying this listen well to lead better concept. Mm -hmm. We're talking with Steve and Becky Harling, authors, co-authors, husband and wife team of the new book, Listen Well, Lead Better, Becoming the Leader People Want to Follow. There are hidden values and hidden gifts and a way to build trust and empower people through the simple act of listening. We're going to take a short break and when we come back we're going to hear more about how to apply these listening gifts, these listening tools, these listening techniques to bring out the best in others so that you raise the level of the water and all the ships will rise. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel. But nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.IgnitingAnation.com forward slash events. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment, is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well now, there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. 
Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Steve and Becky Harling, authors of the new book, Listen Well, Lead Better, Becoming the Leader People Want to Follow. Steve and Becky, welcome back. Thank, Thank you. It's great, great to, to be with you. you. Uh, it's great to be with you. You have such a uh, uh, clear pattern for uh, people to acquire these skills and you start out with really after you become self-aware uh, not be the kind of person that says well that's you know that's enough about me what about me <laughs> you know right. that's that's usually people's people's story and they'll come right back to their own personal experience when you're in the middle of trying to give them an object lesson but to give the gift of trust and empowerment, it seems to be a door breaker. You, you come into this active listening by giving somebody a gift. Mm -hmm. How does that work? You I think that, that one of the absolute best things you can do is by asking a good question. And that's something that Becky and I are really, we prioritize. And I, I think it's the model of Jesus. I mean, Jesus, how many times did Jesus ask questions? Over and over again. In fact, when people asked him questions, he asked them questions in return. Mm -hmm. Questions to me are the best way of drawing people out. And honestly, when you, when you draw out their story, again, they're going to be much more inclined to, to uh, want to hear your story. And you, you're, you're deepening your relationship. You're building a bond. You're building a connection. Uh, to me, the best way to, to do that is to just ask good questions. And I, I also want to I want to add to that. That is true. Asking a good question uh, really unlocks the key to the person's heart, so that you can hear what's important to them. But I and I think that there's a secondary issue for leaders in that a lot of leaders are afraid to release control, mm. um, and so they think in order to be a good leader, I need to control everything. But it, as you ask people questions and as you draw them out, you realize, okay, I can trust this person to make some decisions. I don't have to control everything here. This is one of the problems with religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've, of, I've often said that one of the worst things that ever happened to Jesus was Christianity. <laughs> because yeah, of the well fact stated. that we have 37 million churches and 34,000 denominations. And so we don't seem to, be, seem to be in much unity, much agreement on anything except that Jesus was the Messiah. Well, being Jewish, I can tell you that the Jewish community is united in complete agreement that Jesus was not the Messiah, and mm -hmm. they can be divided on any issue, but they're unified around that. Here we are two and a half billion strong, and we agree to that, but we are disunified uh, because of orthopraxy because we don't believe that women should this and we don't believe that mm -hmm. you, you have to be immersed you have to be sprinkled you have to be splashed you, there's gifts mm -hmm. there's no gifts there's miracles there's prophecy there's we're so divided yeah. over straining the gnat and swallowing the camel is the way that Jesus described it uh, mm -hmm. when you open yourselves up to that question that you ask at the end, what could I have done differently? You become transparent. Mm -hmm. In ministry training, most of us are taught to keep people at an arm's length. It's kind of the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Mm. Yeah. But yet, there is a man behind the CEO. There is a man behind the rabbi. There is a woman behind the strong, powerful speaker. Mm -hmm. And that person, when they connect at the personal level, and I'm not talking about crossing lines, I'm not talking about this spirit of uh, a familiar spirit that mm -hmm. people have that they feel like they can uh, be out of order, out of mm -hmm. line, if you will. And I'm not talking about hurting people and, and, and forcing them. But there is something to be said for uh, everything being done in decency and order and maintaining a certain level of edification, 
of each one. Uh, scripture tells us, let no unwholesome talk come from your mouth, but only that which is for the encouragement and the uplifting of mm. another. Uh, <coughs> leaders are not only somewhat heavy-handed, and we'll put them in the pharisaical category, but they're also afraid to be transparent because they believe that it's a sign of weakness. Mm. How do we come across as being receptive but not shaped by popular opinion? How do we keep theocracy in place and not be driven by democracy, which is not a ministry concept? Right. I think, oh, Go ahead. Have, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'm having a thought. Steve's thought is probably different, so maybe we'll both answer this. Um, I, I think it goes back a little bit to humility and the idea of differentiation. So, okay, I am able to hold my own opinion at, at, in America right now. Um, I can't speak for the rest of the world. I particularly see this here in America. We are so polarized, right? So if, if I'm on one side of the political aisle, I see everybody on the other side as demonic or whatever, okay? And on the other side, they see everybody on this side as demonic or whatever, okay? But I think we need to begin to open the conversation. And and these racial the racial unrest that we're experiencing now in our country is a wonderful opportunity to do that. So both Steve and I in the last 10 days have had conversations with friends of color just saying how does this make you feel? How what how are you experiencing our country? How can I change to help you understand how valued and deeply loved you are, right? And so we open that conversation. In in the political realm, we can ask people on the other side, whatever side that is, how they feel about a per uh, about a specific issue, and we can listen to understand rather than to proving our own point, right? I I am a grown woman, I am mature, I am me, I hold my opinions, which means I'm secure in who I am. I can listen to whoever and hear them and make them feel valued, even if I disagree with them. And, and I think it comes back to this whole idea of humility and being differentiated enough to realize I don't need to prove my point. This is the way this person feels, and I don't need to jump in as the expert and whatever, you know? And so I think that's how I would answer that question. How would you answer it, Steve? Well, you certainly took us off on a whole other rabbit trail. <laughs> which is, well, I think because I'm thinking about it a right. lot right now. I get now, that. I totally get that. Know? But it is definitely a different rabbit trail. But I think to put, it, to put this back in the context of, of leader, uh, one of the one of the most important things for me was coming to the realization that my identity is not in my success, in my achievement, in my position. My identity is I am God's beloved child. Now, as a leader, if my identity is firmly re rooted in I am God's beloved child, then I don't have to prove anything. I can be authentic. I can receive feedback from others. I don't have to come across as the expert. I don't have to come across as the big tonto. I can just accept the reality that I'm an ordinary guy who just happens to be loved by Jesus, who just happens to be in this very important place of leadership. And I can own my opinions, yeah. but I don't have to push them on other people. Um, there's something liberating about having your identity rooted in who you are in Christ because it takes away the need for approval, mm -hmm. takes away the need to have other people, you know, bowing down saying what a great leader you are, and, and it takes away that sense of insecurity that so many leaders struggle with. I mean, leaders honestly struggle with insecurity all the time, but if our identity is in Christ, man, that solves a lot of those issues. When we leave ourselves open for true and meaningful dialogue. Oftentimes people can get emotionally invested in the narrative and feel it is open season for now that I have the freedom to express myself, I can add a critical component to it and take a tone 
that says that uh, becomes more accusatory, uh, mm. more critical. Uh, how do we handle that criticism in a way that uh, we can reframe it and replay it back to them in terms that take the sting, take the edge off the sword so it's not a dagger anymore, it's a pointer pointing something out in us that we now want to reflect back to them in conversation that can make it so that it, it becomes a place where I can apply mortar to patch up a perceived breach in this relationship. Mm. Do you want to answer that? Go ahead. You <laughs> See if you can avoid taking us off on another rabbit trail. <laughs> so, I think you're the expert, though, on <laughs> receiving criticism. But There's anyway, a... I, I think for me, what I am, we're both sensitive in nature, I would say. And I, I think one of the most profound questions that I continue to use to this day, because in leadership, criticism comes all the time. It seems like somebody always is criticizing or whatever. And what I have learned to ask myself, I, I hold what I call a little self-management meeting. You know, when my when I'm starting to spin stories in my head, well, this person thinks this about me or they're saying this about me or whatever. Okay, and I'm spinning stories about the criticism, whatever the criticism was. I literally stop myself in that moment and I ask myself, what is the truth in this situation? And, and I, I use that question to receive what the other person is saying. What's, what's the truth in this situation? Is there any truth in what they're saying about me? Usually I can find some truth there and then I can move forward and either apologize or, uh, or say, I, you know, I'm sorry that that offended you or whatever I have to do to, to make a bridge to that other person's heart again. My goal is to keep my heart open to other people, even those that criticize. And so asking myself that question, what is the truth in this situation, really helps me back up the boat and, and see what's happening. How would, what would you say? Because you get... Because <laughs> I get because I get criticized all the time. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, again, any leader, the the higher you go up the flagpole, the more your end is exposed, right? So uh, there's there's always going to be criticism as a leader. Um, I, rather than viewing it as a foe, I've learned to view it a bit more as a friend. And uh, it doesn't mean that it's always going to go over well. You you don't have to agree with everybody. And I, you know, again, I I feel like. Not every criticism that comes is valid. In fact, most of them probably aren't because most people don't know the full story. Um, but I think to believe that people's intentions generally are good is a healthy thing. And again, there's lots of people out there that are just plain old, you know, narcissistic, critical people that, you, you know, when their criticism comes, you have to figure out how to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but there's so much that we can learn if we have a, a learning spirit and a, and a desire to grow and become more effective. Um, so I've, I've learned to really look for the look for the good in it, but not let it dominate me, and um, and not let myself be you know driven by the need for approval because that doesn't work. One thing that I think you're really good at is, is you know in the positions of leadership that we've held, Steve has gotten or has received a lot of critical emails, right? A lot of times people won't say criticism to your face, mm. but boy, behind an email, they can blast you. <laughs> and, and, and Steve is really a master at sending back a gracious email, thanking that person for their opinion. And it reminds me of, of the verse in scripture that says that a soft answer mm. turns away wrath, you know? And by answering in a soft way a lot of his biggest critics have come back and said hey i you handled this way better than me i'm so sorry and whatever you know but if but if you if you come back combatively and react you stir up the anger so a soft answer is always best you know matthew 18 is the perfect setting for uh dialogue and it actually 
ties in together with another passage that says, when you bring your gift to the altar and thereby mm -hmm. realize your brother has something against you, leave your gift and go be reconciled to your brother. And mm -hmm. then, after you become reconciled, then bring your gift and it will be received. Right. Uh, there are two parallels there. One is if your brother offends you, and then if you go to the altar and you, God brings it to your awareness that this person does have something against you. Uh, we're encouraged to approach and to ask for that critical feedback. What, what is it that's bothering you? What is it about mm. me that's bothering you? What have I done? Uh, not what do you think I've done, um, or to use catchphrases, uh, well, I'm sorry that uh, you feel that way. Uh, that's that's not yeah, there's, there's no that valid word. there's no validation there's no ownership that it, as a matter of fact that is the exact response of Adam. Mm -hmm. He's asked you know did you eat of the fruit and he said he points to God and goes the woman you gave me yeah right it's deflecting points to her and said she gave it to me right and all I did was eat. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are ganging up on me. It's two against one, and you're God. All right? yeah. Take some responsibility, bud. All right? <laughs> you did this, okay? You gave me the woman. Uh, so there's a lot of deflection that goes on and a lot of transference of responsibility. If I'm truly a good listener and I see that somebody is, is blaming me, they're... Uh, projecting upon me where their struggles are. <clears throat> In the model of Jesus, I'm going to ask a question even though I already know the answer. Right. Yeah, I That's love that. That's the key. Uh, yep. how, how do you weave that into listening well and leading better when it comes to that kind of narrative? You know, I, I, I have learned well that the framing of a question is so important. And when I'm in a, in a conflict situation, you know, I, I ask questions like, how did, how did the way I said that, you know, how did that affect you? How did that, how did you perceive that? Um, and I, I, when you, when you ask those kind of questions, you just diffuse a lot of attention. You really do. And you invite a positive, open hearted response. And your body language also says a lot because if you know if you're folding your arms and saying, "Yeah, okay, how did I come across there?" That's not going to work. It's got to be open-hearted, open-handed, you know, honest, honestly looking for the truth. And I think again, if you value relationship, that's the key to this whole thing. Is when you when you listen well, why are you even going to listen well? You're going to listen well because you value the relationship, mm -hmm. and you want that relationship to to be marked by shalom. You want it to be marked by by health. And, and therefore, that's why you ask those hard questions. You know, Beck and I were just talking about this yesterday. Over the course of lots of years in ministry leadership, 30, 40 years of, of CEO and lead pastor, I have had to fire plenty of people for incompetence or for all kinds of other things. And it was kind of interesting to go through back through this list the other day with Becky as we were driving and just thinking through, okay, what is now the relationship that I have with that guy? And surprisingly, the vast majority that I, of people that I have fired, I am in touch with today. Some of them regard me as very dear friends. Even one guy reviews, regards me as a spiritual father. And to me, it's because I took that posture of I care about this relationship. Yes, things have to change. Yes, we've got to, we've got to address these issues. But on the same token, it's the relationship, you know? How do, how do we keep that relationship alive? Mm -hmm. As word in the last maybe uh, five minutes of our interview, I'd like you to take one story, one success story, about an uh, opportunity, uh, an individual that you applied these principles to that narrative and you saw a tangible change, not only in the individual, but in your ability to lead that individual the way they needed to be led. Mm. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so I remember um, a couple, a few years ago now, we were in um, a meeting in another part of the world. I don't want to say what part of the world right now, but and we had 
a, a bunch of our field workers together in a room and um, we, we gave them the opportunity to speak about how they felt about the ministry, how they felt about their leaders, how they felt about things going on. And um, people took a long time and it was, a, it was an emotionally charged meeting. There were a lot of emotions in that room. And um, some people definitely were experiencing anger. Other people were experiencing uh, a lot of sorrow and grief. Other people were experiencing anxiety. And, um, and, and Steve was asking questions. And I was primarily just watching the room. And, and it became clear to me, and Steve was ready to move on. Remember this meeting? He was ready to move on and say, okay, here are the solutions. And I, I gently put my hand on Steve's leg and, and said, can I ask a question? And he said, yes. And I said to the room as a whole, do you feel heard? And the room went silent the atmosphere completely shifted in that room. And, and then they said, there was like a collective sigh. And then there was this answer, yes, we actually do. But I feel like asking them, do you feel heard before we got to the solutions shifted the atmosphere in that room? And that was a very amazing meeting because we had, I don't know, 15 or 20 people in the room, but the relationships were fractured on all different fronts. And I think when I look at the, the, the practical tips in the book, this meeting kind of brought together a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, knowing, going into that meeting, knowing that there, there were all these fractured relationships, I started off by telling a funny story, uh, like a parable. And at the end of the parable, I said, okay, what does the story have to do with us? And everybody busted up laughing, but it diffused a lot of that tension. And then we began to be able to have an honest conversation where it resulted in, I said, look, I've closed the doors, guys. We've got two hours. We're going to get to the bottom of the issues that, that we're all struggling with, and we're going to deal with these things. And so I started with one group, and I said, okay, I want to know you guys. You, you, this is a group over here. I want to know how you have felt treated by this group over here. And it was amazing to watch the people's honesty began to emerge. It took a while for that trust to come forth, but then there were confessions and repentances and asking apologies. And it was really amazing to see how that whole thing kind of played together. But then having that moment where you said, because I was just diving into getting ready for, okay, now we're gonna to get to the solutions. And you felt like, no, no, there's one more question that's gotta be asked. Did you really feel hurt? Because I think that that has been the, you know, for years in the organization, people hadn't felt heard. And it was really important to have that definitive question. You know, do you feel heard uh, before we could go on to the solution? So that's a really, that was a good one. But I'll tell you what, you know, there's another story, Eric, if I could share it with you. You, got, um, you have 45 here, seconds. Okay, so this, is, this is a quick story. <laughs> so here's, here's, the, here's the deal. I was on a, in a taxi in Sydney, Australia, mm -hmm. on my way to the airport. And the taxi driver was from Somalia. And I knew that his faith and my faith, we had been at odds for centuries. And in that taxi, as we were driving along, you know, uh, I began to ask him, I said, listen, I just want to know how you, how you think about, uh, about us. And I said, if you had a piece of advice for me as a Christian, what advice would you give me? And that taxi driver looked across at me as we're driving through along the harbor in Sydney, Australia. And he said, listen, he said, the problem is, you Christians, you talk all the time, and you, you expect us to believe everything you say, but you never take the time to actually listen to us. And, you know, I, I just apologized and said, I'm really sorry, man. I, I didn't realize that, that we or I was coming across that way. I, I don't, I, I feel really badly about that. And it was amazing how it just broke open. Beautiful conversation about the Lord. And, and in the end, we, it was wonderful. I was able to pray with him uh, right as we stopped at the airport in Sydney. Um, but it really struck me, boy, we've got some work to do as followers of Jesus to restore trust by listening. By listening. That's the key to the entire message here of listen well, lead better. There's a direct correlation to your ability to listen to the hearts of the people that you work with, your coworkers, your subordinates, to become a better leader 
to become the leader people want to follow. Those secrets, those tips contained within the pages of this book, pointing back to Jesus' own probative style in opening people's hearts up to share with him what it was that they wanted. You can become that kind of leader by applying these principles. Visit ignitingnation.com and click on today's interview under the name Steve and Becky Harling, and it'll take you to a link to get the book. I highly recommend it. Steve and Becky Harling, great honor and privilege to be with you today. What a blessing, great message. And Becky, I look forward to seeing you back here when your new book releases on <laughs> Listening Better So Your Kids Will Talk to You. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. What a Thank joy. You. God Thank bless you, you both. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs> 